do you think, in your view, the UK has effectively used its position in multilateral organisations to, to promote debt relief in response to the current uh, coronavirus crisis and also the debt crisis? Not enough. So the... Um, Just before have... you proceed, on, as you say, not enough, I'd be grateful if you could give a specific example of what more the UK could do since the outbreak. Yeah. So the main response has been the G20 has created a mechanism to suspend debt payments, uh, but that only applies to debts to other governments. So it's useful. It's um, suspended about five billion dollars of debt payments this year, but it only addresses one of the three main groups of debt. So the next main group is debt owed um, to private lenders. And those have continued to be paid through the crisis. The G20 called on private lenders to voluntarily suspend debt payments, and they haven't. And this is the key thing for the UK, because although very little debt is owed to the UK government, so it ha doesn't have much of a role to play there, most debt owed by these countries that the scheme applies to is, owed, is governed by English law. And of the debts owed to commercial banks, 30% of those are owed to banks based in the UK, which is by far the highest of any individual country. So it's on the private debt where the UK both has the most important moral voice and could take the practical action to um, take legal measures so that countries could suspend their debt payments um, to these private lenders. And um, while the UK has supported this suspension of debt payments to other governments, they've not taken any action on the private debt or made um, that any um, calls on um, the private lenders to take action. Thank you. And I think um, the, the point about private lenders is very important. And uh, you, you talked previously, I think, in the first question about the use of English law, uh, which governs these agreements. Um, do you think, I, I, I know you made the point about the, U, the UK is owed a very little amount of, amount of debt, if you look at the actual numbers. Uh, but could you give a specific example of what more the UK could, do, could have done since the outbreak? Um, I, 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 I know the point you make about commercial lenders and, and also the, the legislation. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's our number one um, area the UK could take action. The next is that the third grouping of debt alongside to other governments and to private lenders is to multilateral institutions like the IMF and World Bank. And there the um, World Bank has refused to suspend any debt payments to it. And the UK has a key voice there. It's one of the main donors to the International Development Association part of the World Bank. So again, they um, kind of pushed for a suspension um, or cancellation of debt payments, which um, we've worked up detail of how that could be paid for through funds the IMF and World Bank have. The UK, um, one thing they did do is the IMF is um, cancelling now $500 million of debt payments for the um, grouping of the absolute poorest countries, which is, again, useful. And some of that is paid for by the UK. So the UK has played an important role in funding that and getting it agreed. But it's ultimately still a drop in the ocean. So this year, the 73 countries that are eligible for this debt suspension scheme, uh, they have had $5 billion of debt suspended. 500 million cancelled to the IMF and $33 billion is still being paid. So it's only about 15% of the debt has been suspended or cancelled. And most of it has continued to be paid through the crisis. And the UK's key role in that is that much, many of the debts are governed by English law. Uh, Mr. Jones, the, the newly formed FCDO tells us that with UK support, the multilateral development banks are making over 200 billion dollars available to developing countries uh, and businesses over over 15 month time time window this money is aimed at uh, strengthening the health response um, to limit impacts on vulnerable groups supporting a sustainable recovery after the crisis and uh, to keep the private sector operating um, what is this going to do to a debt burden on on these on these developing countries yes so um they a lot of that support will be given as loans and crucially it is loans in foreign currency so that um, even though the interest rates can be quite low um, 
between 0.5% and 2% for many of the countries we're talking about. The, it still creates a big risk um, because of um, the, the foreign currency burden. The um, example I started mentioning before is Sierra Leone, where the IMF and World Bank lent a, a very large amount compared to the size of Sierra Leone's economy um, to help deal with and recover from the Ebola crisis. And that now, um, five years later, has left Sierra Leone in a debt crisis. It was already cutting um, public spending um, before the COVID crisis began. And so loans can be useful um, if they're um, able to be well invested, but loans in response to a um, economic shock of this magnitude, where you suddenly have completely revised um, growth projections, government revenue projections, uh, leaves um, countries with much higher um, debt burdens, and so um, in a weaker position for the future. And um, we only have 10 years left to meet the sustainable development goals. That's going to be very difficult uh, if the next 10 years we have a debt crisis, which in the 1980s and 1990s we had two lost decades of development because of the scale of debt and it took far too long to deal with it. So this time we need to uh, nip it in the bud and prevent it from becoming a, a drag on the next 10 years. If we had a lot more time, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to maybe dig a bit more about, you know, uh, there are countries with crushing debt and uh, the loans possibly don't help them as much as people think they would, but I don't have the, I don't, we don't have the time and the chair is looking at me, so I'll move on.